shall not be moved. I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved on my way to glory land, and I shall not be moved on my way to glory land. like a tree planted by the water I shall not be Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. be to God, I will not be moved. Glory be to God, now I will not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. No, I shall not be moved. Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. I thought I'd bring you guys out. I'll do a little intro and show you one of my favorite spots. Setting out here with the Lord. I've got uh, got my Bible. Got some hymns. I got Alexander Scorby. Uh, some days I bring out some food, like picnicking. I got my water. <laughs> and most importantly, I have the Holy Spirit. And I'm out here in God's creation. So, we're going to do this a little bit differently. Brother says, Christ, we always dream, you know, dream of having a house church. And, and if I had a house, right now my house church of one. So if we were in house church of one and we're, we meet out here on a beautiful day when the weather allows us to be outside, what would we do? Well, we'd open up with prayer. And then we'd sing a couple hymns. So I thought we'd sing a couple hymns. As we're singing a couple hymns, Brother says, Christ, I want to remind you and ask you, have you been staying in this book? Starting your day with the Word of God. Ending your day with the Word of God. Have you been staying in prayer? Praying. Remember, prayer is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication between you and God, your Creator, your Savior, the man who saved you. Remember, there's one meeting between Christ and man, the man Christ Jesus, one name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus. Do you have that relationship with your Lord and Savior? Are you praying without ceasing, the Bible says. I pray, brothers and Christ, that this finds you staying in the Word of God, staying in prayer, and living for Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into this study about, are you, are you a Christian? Are you in Christ? But those that are in Christ, those that are Christians, what's going to happen to us at the day of that blessed hope? The day of Christ. Uh, the day of redemption. Okay, here's an old hymn called, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. I like this old hymn. 
When the trumpets of the Lord shall sound, and sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones are gathered to their homes beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Brothers and Christ, I like this song. I like this hymn because it reminds me that, hey, this last verse, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Why? We don't know when we're supposed to go up. And we're going to get in that in this study, looking for that blessed hope. Okay? If you're in Christ, you're looking for that blessed hope. If you're not in Christ, you're looking at the world. If you're falling away, you're looking at the world. You're not looking for Jesus Christ. We'll get into that in the study. The difference between someone who's fake, false convert, brethren that have fallen away, and someone who's truly saved and in a standing point. Someone who's truly saved and they've fallen away. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. But I like this. For we labor for the master till dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. You're supposed to be a living and, and verbal witness. A lot of people love being a verbal witness, but we need to be a living witness too laboring then when all life is over and our work on earth is done our work if you're still here you're still breathing brother says christ your work isn't done until god calls you home in death or calls you home in life our work here is not done mm -hmm. that, that's a great song about us going up those that are in christ christians we're going up when god calls us home right? when it's time it's time and yes, it happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. Another song I like to sing is, What a Day That'll Be. I've sung it before, but I want to sing it again. What a day that'll be. What day? When we get caught up, we get our new bottles, this bodies. This corruption shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. Okay? We get to go home to be with our Savior and spend eternity with Him. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see And I look upon his face The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day that will be There'll be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be 
What a day that will be When my Jesus I shall see And I look into his face The one who saved me by his grace And he takes me by the hand And leads me through the promised land What a day, glorious day that will be what a day glorious day that will be see lord brother and sister christ we pray to the lord and we're working hard for him we stay in prayer we stay in the word we hide in our heart we be a living witness and a ver verbal witness let us labor for the master from dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care when life then when all life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. What a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see. Brother says, Christ, it's closer than you think. It's closer than you think. We're going to get into this a little bit about brethren that are turning their back on looking present tense for that blessed hope. And the danger and how it's causing brethren when they don't look for that... We, some people call it the imminent return of Jesus Christ, but the Bible teaches, Paul teaches, we're supposed to be looking present tense for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. You're to live every day if Jesus Christ comes back today. You're to live every day with the attitude, if Jesus comes back tomorrow, what do I need to get done for him today? How do I need to be living for him today? Am I living right for him today? Am I pleasing him in his sight today? Not putting it off because you're putting off the catching away of the body of Christ. Some of the brethren are doing this. Now, I can feel the wind. I got a, 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 a tarp over us. So it might flap a little bit, and we'll see how it works with the mic. And we're going to get into this Bible study. Okay, brothers and sisters Christ, once again, I want to pray that you're doing great, that you're staying in the Word of God, that you're reading it every day. Like I said, I Alexander Scorvey, you can take it anywhere and listen to it. I got a little speaker here and I got the tablet. You can listen to Alexander Scorvey anywhere you go. Uh, you can listen to it while you work, but you're taking God's word, you're hiding it in your heart, and you're living it. Okay? Uh, you're staying in prayer, you're praying over the book. I remember a, a preacher, I think it was Peter Ruckman, but a preacher once said, and he got it from someone else, but we passed along good sayings where he's preaching that says that uh, you should pray over this book. You're to read this book. You're to pray over this book. You're to live this book. You're to stand for this book. And if it ever comes down to it, you gotta be willing to die for this book. And if it comes down to it, you die for this book. You die for the Lord and His Word, His way. All right. Now some of the stuff I'm gonna have to look up, but Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. We're going to be talking about a Christian today. Okay? Uh, what does Christian mean? A lot of people have always taught, taught me it just means you follow Christ. You just mean you follow Christ. Well, Judas Iscariot followed Christ. You know, Judas, the one who betrayed him. What does it really mean to be a Christian? It's a little bit more than just following him. It's being in Christ. Christ in Christian or in Christ. And today the world has stolen that word and you have all these false converts. And I remember we did a study recently on uh, Aaron. You know, uh, are you acknowledging God in all your ways, Aaron? We talked about we got to get all the false Christians out because they're ruining the body of Christ. And they are. And they're scattering the brethren and they're setting a bad example to the world. So we're going to do a little talk about a test that you can... Am I a Christian? Okay. Am I still a Christian indeed? Am I still in a standing position? Or am I falling flat on my face? Am I a false convert? Well, the easiest way to find out if you're a false convert is you ask them the gospel they got saved off of. What's the gospel? Reading here, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ after salvation, after God saves you, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So walk ye in him. Real quick, what's the true plan of salvation? Repentance towards God. You come to God fearing him. Because, like I said, we need to preach more on what sin is. We need to preach more on the cost of sin. Hell, and then the lake of fire. You've broken the law of sin and death. And now, because you broke the law of sin and death, God's wrath and God's judgments upon you. 
and you're going to wind up going to hell someday. That's where you're heading. When I was lost, that's where I was heading. And you come and you say, okay, you come to God broken. The Bible says there's a road right here, so we might have some cars come by. So we got a truck coming. So we'll hear what the Bible says when it comes to repentance. Who's this Christ when it comes to repentance? For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. The sorrows of the world worketh death. Right? The Bible says in the Old Testament that God is, is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. In the Psalms, he's nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. You come to God broken and having sorrow. Right, right there when we read, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. For what? Like I said, if you're preaching against sin and you're warning about hell, that sorrow is, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death. The law of sin and death. Hell. And then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. As ye have received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him. That's when you turn to the cross and that sorrow gets magnified. And you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. How he died, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How he died for our sins and that he was that he uh, that he died and according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures those three things how he died the blood that was shed on the cross is God the Father's blood the Bible says feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood and there's other passages talking about how it was God's blood that was shed on the cross God sacrificed his body, his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And the blood that was shed. You learn in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And it talks about how the blood, the blood of bulls and goats could cover sins, but they couldn't take them away. It takes a perfect lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. You have to believe that Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. And it's his blood that is shed for your sins. You come to the cross. And having sorrow for your personal sins, you throw that old man at the foot of the cross. You throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross and you say, Lord, this is this is when you get into this, the third part. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You throw yourselves at the foot of the cross. Lord, I look, here's my sins. Not the world's sins. Not you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. No, I am a sinner. And you throw your sins at the foot of the cross. Lord, these are my sins. This is my evidence. This is the proof. This is the fact that I am a sinner. And I'm on my way to hell. And I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. But I believe in your son. That the blood that was shed is your blood, O oh Lord. And it can wash my sins away. And that he died and was buried and rose again the third day, proving that he is God the Father manifest in the flesh. God Almighty. You confess it in prayer. And the last step, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be. Future tense. I always get into this with brethren. Brothers from Christ, not brethren, but this easy believism world. Everything I told you says it has to happen before God saves you. All those steps. Repentance. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer. Ask God to save you. All of it, the Bible says it comes before God saves you. And God will look at the heart. Remember what the heart man believeth in righteousness? Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. God looks at the heart. You're in the right position. You're broken. You know Job in the Old Testament, he fell on his knees and abhorred himself in dust and ashes. You had one of the kings, I'm going through this now, and I'm in 2 Kings, I just finished up 1 Kings, and one of the kings that God proclaimed, I'm going to do this to you, I'm going to do this because you, you've, you've wronged me, worship false gods, you did this wrong, and the king put on sackcloth and ash. This is a king, the top of the top, I mean, 
as far as people looking up to him as a king. He falls on his knees, puts on sackcloth, dust and ashes in his head, and he humbles himself before the Lord. And God saves him and says, it's not going to happen in your time. God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and save such that be of a contrite spirit. He looks at the heart. We have, oh, we, have, we have so many false converts today. Why? Because it's no longer a heart issue. It's a head issue. They say you miss heaven by 13 inches. It's up here, but it never makes it down here. It's all about a verbal profession of faith, and that's it. Who cares how many times in the Pauline epistles that Paul says, prove your own selves, prove your own selves, prove your own selves. I've proven myself, Paul says. You know that we are not reprobates. We've proven it, but watch out for the reprobates. Watch out for the false converts, false brethren. Watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. He talks about it time and time again. So if we can get into this, let's get over to Corinthians. We're just warming up, sorry. We're just warming up a little bit. We're going to go over to Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We start uh, 23. 23. It says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. We're going to talk about wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And there's, you get all these people that like to mock God and think they're stronger than He is. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Even God, if He ever was, I don't believe He ever is, but the point He's making, even if you believe that God can be at a weak point, even His weakest point, you, that this lost world keeps pointing out how weak this God is, our God is, how weak, even at His weakest point, He's still stronger than man could ever be. Can I get an amen on that? Stronger than man could ever be. Verse 26, for ye, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, the sorrows of the world worketh death, when we talked about repentance, what gets in the way, this is the condemnation that light is coming into the world, and that men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil, neither come into the light, lest their deeds be reproved. What gets in the way of people getting saved? The lust of the flesh. Someone who truly understands salvation understands that after I'm saved, I belong to Jesus Christ and I need to walk in Him and He's the boss. He's going to clean up my life. I'm going to start living a holy life. I'm going to start living a godly life and I'm going to start doing things God's way. I'm going to start seeing things God's way. And that's why most of the false, this easy believism out there, faith alone, faith alone, they always preach a no change life. Why? Because they don't want to come to God broken. They don't have true sorrow in their heart for sinning against Him. They love their sin. How not many wise men after the flesh. Oh, there doesn't have to be a change like We're going to show today there does. And in, when it comes to the falling away, brothers of Christ, as we go through this study, we're going to be trying, I might not always mention, but have this in mind. You can have someone who's saved and meets these standards. You can have someone who was, that's still saved, but used to meet these standards, but things get in the way. The flesh. They start backpedaling. They start resurrecting the old man. But at one point, they met this requirement, they're saved. But now they meet the requirements where the Bible talks about the falling away. And then that man of sin be revealed and we get caught up. There's a falling away. And there was a falling away in Paul's day. But that, I don't want to add to the word of God, but sometimes we slip up and we say great falling away. And why do we say great? Because this falling away is separate from the average falling away that we see all in Paul's day all the way to today. But it's saying as we get closer, it's like a rock rolling downhill. Okay, as we get closer and closer to that catching up, as that rock gets closer and closer to the bottom of the hill, it's going to be going faster and faster and faster. If it was a snowball, it gets bigger and bigger. But the point is, the falling away gets worse in the end. It's worse in the end than it was in Paul's day. And when it comes to right before we get caught up. Okay. 
Not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The Bible talks about how, when we're going to talk about false converts, got to get them out, got to get them out. The Bible talks about how you have men, and like I said, you can have men that are falling away, that are saved. There's brethren that I believe are saved, but they're falling away, and I can't have fellowship with them until they get their heart right with the Lord. There's a falling away. But the Bible talks about how you have men that handle the word of God deceitfully. Paul says, you know that we are as men that handle the word of God deceitfully. We've proved ourselves. Okay, we proved ourselves. But you've got men that handle the word of God deceitful. You've got men that try to wrestle, men and women, that try to wrestle the scriptures to their own destruction. They try to get this book right here to conform to them. They don't conform to this book. They get this book to conform to them. They mess up the book. They lose their way. They're no longer doing things God's way. They're doing things their way. And they're trying to act like God's on their side when he's not. Verse 28. Or, I'm sorry. The weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. You have to become broken. God has his ways. The Holy Bible talks about the Holy Spirit going out in the world to reprove the world of sin. God has his way of breaking people. My job is not to break you if you come across this and you're a false convert or you're lost, just flat out lost. It's not my job to break you. It's my job to preach the truth. And the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit going out in the world to convict the world of sin and you have a conscience, the Bible talks about. You have the laws of God that are written on your heart. God will do the breaking. God will do the convicting. I'm just supposed to preach the truth and plant seeds of truth. I'm supposed to do it in meekness. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Peradventure they should recover the, themselves out of the snare of the devil that are taken captive by him at his will. Okay. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. We're going to get into this a little bit more, but as we get into verse 30 and 31, but flesh should glory in his presence. Remember when Paul, Paul, it's normally a back road, not many people are on this road, but remember Paul where he's talking about that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end, or whose God, whose God is their belly, lust of the flesh. Remember what, what God uh, Satan, not God, but Satan, pose, tr loves to pose as God. He, he wants to be God. Uh, he promised Eve in the garden, ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. Yea, hath God said, ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. Whose God is their flesh, they're the final authority. They're their own lowercase g God. Whose glory is in their shame. I had a brother in Christ hit me up once when I, hit, I said it's a sin for men to have long hair. He said, no, it doesn't say it's a sin, it's a shame. I said, yeah, it says it's a shame for men to have long hair. But what are they supposed to be shamed of? That sin of, of growing your hair out and trying to look like a woman. Oh, well, it just says shame. Just say, it also says shame at that other spot where it says how they glory in their shame. What are they glorying in? Sin, worldliness. Which is still sin. Anytime you're growing against God, it's sin. When God says, don't do this and you do it, you've sinned. If God says, do this and you don't do it, it's sin. Pray without ceasing. Study to show thyself approved unto God. These are commands. If you're not staying in the Word of God and staying in prayer every day, you're in sin. You're failing the Lord. That no flesh of glory in his presence says that they glory in their shame. And we see it in this world today. False Christians, they're just glorying in their shame. The Bible says that's sin. How you're dressed is sin. How you're acting is sin. How you're talking is sin. What you're standing for is wickedness and worldliness and sin. And they're glorying in it. I'm ashamed and vexed by it. Remember Lot, Lot and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was vexed daily by the filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed by the wickedness that was around him. We're vexed by the wickedness of this world. And you have someone say, oh, I'm a Christian, and they love, and they get along with the world. That no flesh should glory in his place. They glory in their shame. 
It says, who my, whose end is destruction, who mind earthly things. They've become worldly. Or they, were, they never got saved and they were always worldly. Here it is, verse 30. There's the big verse that I keep trying to push and some brethren are fighting me. I wish they would stop and just conform to this book. You're not fighting me, you're fighting this book. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We just read that verse over here where it says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, you're now in Christ Jesus. So walk ye in him. But if him are ye in Christ Jesus, these are people who are saved, but he's negating these people. But the foolishness of, of God is wiser than men. You know, these people that attack the word of God, that attack God's way, that attack our Lord and Savior. But, negates all this, of him are ye. Now he's going back to talking about brethren. People that are truly saved and born again. But are ye, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according to as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Brother says Christ, I've backpedaled before. I've gotten back into old addictions when I was first saved. I think I told this in my testimony. It took several years for God to get Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games pouring out of my life after I got saved. I struggled with the Lord. But it got to get, because I kept trying to glory in my shame. I kept trying to find excuses and justification for that filth and wickedness. And there's some brethren that I believe still do. There's some false converts that come in and really promote that. Oh, you can still play video, Hollywood movies, watch Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. Uh, no. The court is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Your life should be you glorying the Lord. Giving God the glory. I have people that, try, that slip up. I know you do sometimes, brother, says Christ. You slip up and you try to give me the glory. I always try to correct you, not because I'm being mean. I'm trying to help you so you don't make the mistakes I did. There's times where I gave men the glory. There's times where I stole the glory for myself. All glory be to God. The court is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I always correct him and say, Give God the glory. Don't give me the glory. Give God the glory. If God uses me, praise the Lord. What happened there? I just gave God the glory. God uses me and you give God the glory. Praise the Lord for this study. Praise the Lord that, that he helped me with this, with this message. You give God the glory. Okay. Now, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus that hath made unto us wisdom. We did a huge study on the wisdom, but we'll go over it a little bit here. Okay, wisdom. This is one of the signs of someone who's truly saved and born again. It starts with fear of the Lord. How do we know that? Because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We have another study out called the beginning. If it has a beginning, there's an end. If there's a beginning of something, there's an end. Okay? Uh, new beginnings and, all, and whatnot we talk about in that study. But wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I've talked about this. The lost world doesn't want to actually fear God, so they'll change that. They'll take the verse that's in Psalms that says, because there's two of them, that the, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And they say the knowledge, just knowing God is, that's what, that's what means fearing God. Fearing God is just knowing God. You just got to know who he is. No, fearing God is fearing God. How do we know this? Because the other verse says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and a good understanding have all they that keep his commandments. Now that lightens up that first verse we read. The knowledge of the holy is understanding, knowing God's way. When you know what God's way is and you you have that fear, it helps motivate you to do things God's way, to keep God's commandments. And I've said this before, if you're not keeping God's commandments, remember we rightly divide 2 Timothy 2.15, so I'm talking about the commandments for today, the time of the Gentiles, the, the commandments for today. What motivates us to keep him as a saved sinner? We fear God. 
the Bible talks about, by the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what that verses are talking about, brothers and sisters? I got a little confused when I was younger. And as you study the Word of God, you study the Word of God, God shows you things. You know what that those verses are talking about? It's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. It's a fearful thing. We all have to answer for our life as a Christian to Jesus Christ who's going to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. How we get to spend eternity is determined by how we live for Jesus Christ today. I keep talking to some of the brothers like this. I was like, when I get to heaven, I don't need food. I don't need a roof over my head. I don't need to sleep. The things that we do, we look at it down here, our rewards, you know, that's going to be tons of gold and silver. Yes, it likens our rewards to the gold and silver and precious stones pass through the fire and survive. Those works pass through the fire and survive. And then you have the wood, hay, and stubble that get burnt up. But it talks about if all your work is burnt up, you got nothing to show for your life as a Christian, you're saved as so by fire. Why? Because we're sealed into the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. If you're truly saved and you don't amount to much as a Christian, you have that changed life, but you fall down, that first time you fall down, you never get up, and you amount to nothing as a Christian, you're going to get up there with almost nothing, if nothing, other than, hey, the crown of life, you know, that eternal life. You have your eternal life, but you don't have much to show for your life as a Christian. Right? It's a fearful thing Paul talks about. But he talks about we're all supposed to run a race as if one receiveth the prize. We're supposed to be fear motivated when it comes to living for the Lord and doing what's right by Him. I'm f I always talk about this. We get to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to have people when I, Philip Newton, come up hither. My fear when I first got saved and I started learning when when I first got saved. If you remember in my testimony, I was like, if I just ha wash the feet of the saints. If I just get to wash the feet of the saints that enter in, you know, to heaven and everything, because I didn't know better, I was I was newly saved in heaven, and I just I'm just so grateful to be here, you know, saved so as by fire. You still go to heaven no matter what. If you're truly saved and born again, you're sealed. I'm just grateful to be here. Then God opened my eyes to the scriptures and say, you need to you need to aspire to more. You need to do good works. You need to start earning some rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Because how you're going to spend eternity, I believe, is going to be determined by how you live for Jesus today. You get in, but how are you going to spend eternity? Sometimes I pray and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to earn enough reward rewards that wherever you go, I get to go. You say, well, where do you get that? The Bible says, if you suffer with him, what's the reward? You shall also reign with him there's things that you do down here for the Lord there's things you do for the Lord down here that affects how you get to live for the Lord for eternity people who didn't suffer for Jesus Christ I believe you're gonna get stuck in heaven when Jesus comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble you're gonna get stuck in heaven for that thousand years and then some because when Satan's let loose for a season you're gonna be stuck in heaven you don't get to come down and serve God down here. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about certain things you do to earn rewards in heaven, and it has to do with how we get to serve God. We shall be kings and priests, the Bible talks about. Mm -hmm. But wisdom, okay, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What's the end of wisdom? You're keeping God's commandments. You're doing things God's way. You're seeking to please Him. Remember it says, For thou art worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. What pleases God? You go to Ecclesiastes once again. He goes through and talks about the life is just, it's all vanity without Jesus Christ. And he talks about there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. And he goes through all of the, anything you possibly think of that's wonderful down here. It's all worthless without Jesus Christ. It's all worthless without a God, a creator. And he gets to the end, he says, let's hear the whole sum of the matter. The whole book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to sum it all up. What is it? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. 
fear God and keep his commandments. What's the number one commandment today, brother says Christ? We've obeyed it. What's the number one commandment today? Obey the gospel. And I've, to and I've, I've told you through the scriptures what the gospel is. Obey the gospel. For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, who believeth our report? If the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. And I can go through uh, John 3, 16 again, where it talks about light has come into the world, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. They refuse to obey the gospel. And you know what Satan's done? He's come down here, and he's offered him a gospel where you don't have to fear God. Easy believism, faith alone. Gospel where you don't have to fear God. And that's the most popular one, where they take repentance out, they even take prayer out. And now it's just head knowledge. They just have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the latter end is worse than the beginning. It would have been better if they had not known the way of righteousness. When you have someone that's a false convert, it's hard to lead them to Christ. But I'm going to tell you one thing. It's possible. How do I know that? You're looking at one. I was a false convert for most of my life, falling for this easy believism garbage. Faith alone. Chapter and verse where it says faith alone. And James, in the book of James, it says, uh, Faith without works is dead, being alone. It's the only time you see alone and faith together. Brothers says Christ, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Through faith. But it's God's grace that saves. It's grace alone. It's always been grace alone. God saves by His grace, and how you find His grace is different in different dispensations, but it's through the faith. What? The faith that when God says, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. Faith and repentance. God said you're to repent, you're to repent. God says you're to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God says you're to confess both in prayer, you confess both in prayer. If God says you're to ask Him for salvation, they won't even ask. They're trying to take prayer out of salvation. They don't even ask for salvation. Why? Because they've earned it, they've turned faith into works, and they're acting like they've earned it, and when you've earned something, you just take it. If you haven't earned something, you ask for it. If it's a gift, you ask for it. They destroy the gift part where it says it's not of work, it's, it's a gift of God, not of works. When they take prayer out and they don't ask God, if I've earned something, you go and you, 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 you demand what you've, you've earned. Hey, that's mine, give it to me. But if you're hurting, I need some help. I could need some food. I need, you know, I, I need help paying a bill or something. You ask, I need help. I, I, I need help, you ask. Why? Because you don't deserve it. They take prayer out. No fear of the Lord. No fear whatsoever. Brother, sister Christ, when it comes to this, the biggest test, the very first test is the fear. We always ask people, what's their attitude towards this book? What's their attitude, to, attitude towards what God says is right and wrong? I hit people up when it comes to wisdom and they fail that first test. These easy blues have always... I would have failed the first test before I truly got saved and born again. Came to the knowledge of the truth that the King James Bible is God's perfect written word in English. Got the book. Believed it. Heard the gospel, the true plan of salvation for the first time. Because I was told repentance is just, you know, going from unbelief to belief. So we really just say believe, believe, and, they, and, then, and then they take prayer out, or they try to turn prayer. That prayer just means, call just means believe. It doesn't mean ask God to save you in prayer. It just means believe. So repentance means believe. Then we have belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Then prayer just means, it doesn't mean prayer, it means believe. So it's just believe, believe, believe. So only believe, only believe. And we're sitting there, we're like... I believed that garbage for a long time. I was a false convert. I was on my way to hell. I was one of those people that it had been better if I had not known the way of righteousness. But I believe in context, because I know some brethren might hit me up in context, I believe it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, but for instruction righteous, I was one of those false converts, false brethren. I was on my way to hell. And God brought me to the Bible version issue. He got me on my knees. He got me broken. 
and I repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save him. It started here and it came out here in prayer. And I fell on my knees and God saved me. And the life of a Christian, someone who's truly saved and born again, you'll see the change. Some are forgetting. Remember, they fall away. We talked about this. But after salvation, you see that change. You see that fear of God. You see that desire to take God's word and hide it in their heart and live it. Keep God's commandments. And I've hit people up with this. People are professing to be saved. And I'm going to use this as an example, sisters in Christ. So please understand it's not an attack. I'll, I'll try to think of one for a guy. But one of the biggest ones I see around here is you see all these women. A lot of them are elderly. Oh, I'm saved and I love Jesus Christ. And they've got short hair. They've cut their hair so short. And they're wearing men's apparel. And they're feminists. That woman Jezebel. And I hit them up. And I'm not judging. Remember, judge not on the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. He that is spiritual judgeth all things through this book. But he himself is judged of no man. Okay? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Okay, time and time again. Okay? So I hit them up and I say, what does the Bible say? What are the three? I, 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 I'll give them sometimes. I'll give, I say, I'll give you two. This is for both men and women. And I'll ask men this sometimes, okay? The Bible says that we're not supposed to pierce the flesh or mark up the flesh. We're not supposed to have cuttings in the flesh. It's in the book. Piercings are a sin. People always say, what about in the Old Testament where they did the all in the one ear? To become a bond servant for life. We're, sp life. we're supposed to have that spiritual piercing that's that all spiritual all where we're now a bond servant to jesus christ for life our life belongs to him he's our master we're his servants he commands we obey and we have to fear displeasing our master fear not doing his commands that fear needs to be there but you hit there's that those two things that i talk about tattoos body piercings those are sins but that's for both men and women but what are the three commands god gives on the appearance of a woman What's the three commands? Um, a, woman is, a woman has long hair. Why? Because it is a blessing given to her by God. Women, your sisters in Christ, you're supposed to have long hair. And they always try to argue it. I say down to the shoulders because the Bible likens your long hair to a man being a head covering for you. And if it's a head covering, they include the neck and you know the back of the head and the face. All this is the head, so down to the shoulders or longer. I'd always go just down. I, I go. I, I love long hair, but even longer than the shoulders. But if you're down to the shoulders, okay. But these women are buzz cutting. I mean, seriously, the elder women around here, just even the lost women that don't even have a profession of faith, they're really they're they're almost as short as my hair. <laughs> okay. And you ask me, says, what does the Bible say? Okay, you're supposed to have you're supposed to have long hair. The Bible says you're to dress modestly. Okay? The Bible says that you're not to wear the apparel of men. Now, what I'm judging them off of is do they fear God to the point where you show them the scriptures? Are they going to keep? Are they going to? Are they going to repent and try their best to keep God's commandments, or are they going to come back with a little bit? Don't hurt. That's just your interpretation. Uh, we know when to quit. All those excuses they get from the lost world when they try to justify sins. It all depends on how you look at it. And they try to mess this book up to try to make it where the head covering isn't hair. And that the head covering that God's liking to the hair, that's not a man in authority over you. No, no, no it isn't. It's not a man in authority. They always try to mess with this book. They, they handle the word of God deceitfully. They wrestle the scriptures to their own destruction. And what I'm judging, brother, says Christ, is the fear of the Lord. I'm just using it. There's all kinds of sins. Drunkenness, uh, fornication, you know. What's their attitude to God says this is a sin or God, God says it's an abomination? You know, sodomy is an abomination and everything. What's their attitude towards this book? Do they fear God and have a desire to keep his commandments? Or are they their own lowercase g God, and they get to decide what their commandments they are that they want to follow? Where's the fear of God? They always, oh, that's just your interpretation. That's just your, you know, your opinion. That's just, you, that's just, that might be for you, but that's just not for me. You're right, it's not for you, because you're not 
saved and born again, or you've fallen away. Some sisters in Christ might have gotten gung-ho about wearing modest dresses, but over time, it's, it's hard. I, I'm not a woman, but I've had sisters in Christ talk to me that says, when you've never been raised on wearing a dress, because if you were raised on wearing a dress and having to do everything in a dress, it would become second nature. You wouldn't, there would be no complaining, no whining. It's just, this is normal, like it was in the past. Women wore dresses, and they did everything in a dress. No problem, no complaining, no whining. But when you're raised in pants and do anything in pants and shorts, the man's apparel, and you give your life to Christ, and now God shows you this and says, hey, you need to start wearing a dress. Yes, Lord, I love you, Lord, and I want to do things your way, and I fear you, Lord, and I want to please you, Lord, and I want you to say, well done, thou good and faithful one. I'm going to start wearing a dress. It's hard getting used to doing everything in a dress once you've grown up. Men. You know, the long hair, I said, the, uh, just using this same anal uh, topic of the appearance, man's appearance. They're given two commandments, not three, two. Okay, they're to have, they're, it's a shame for men to have long hair. Men are supposed to have short hair. Now, people will try to grab certain things from the Bible. What about this? Now, God can say, okay, for this situation, I'm going to overlook it for this situation. But the commonly across the board, across the board, all men are supposed to have short hair. The Bible says men are not supposed to wear the apparel of women. And this is where a lot of them try to get into those debates. Be careful, brothers and sisters, getting into debates. But I've gotten into them, several of them, when I was newly saved. But it comes down to this. They always say, well, there's women's apparel. They just, if they change the tag, like pants that say women. So if the tag says women, that makes it women's apparel. And I always throw this right back in their face. I said, so if they make a dress and put a tag on it and says, for men, does that make it men's apparel? Hello? Anybody home? Crickets? I'm hearing crickets. Exactly. That's just a cop-out. Okay? I'm not judging. You can have a sister in Christ that's newly saved, doesn't know any better. You can have a sister in Christ that, that gave in and... And, it's, and, you know, falling away, you know, in a fallen state, backpedaling, and you're correcting her, and she's like, you're right, I shouldn't have gave in, I shouldn't have done this, I need to go back to wearing pants, uh, get rid of the pants and get back to wearing modest dresses. I need, you're right, I shouldn't have gotten drunk, right, I shouldn't have done this sin, I shouldn't have done that sin. It's their attitude towards God. Do they fear God, and they love His Word? Uh, um... King David said that thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. How you walk. When we read that, you walk in him. How you live your life is based off this book. God's book. God's word. His commandments. It talks about uh, thy, command, thy servant loveth thy commandments. And I'm kind of still trying to memorize this one. But he talks about how and he med meditates on them night and day. You take God's word. You stay in it every day because you want to make sure that you don't fail the Lord and you're living it. You don't get talked out of the Lord of the Lord to the left or to the right. You don't get deceived because you don't know this book. With good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. Yeah, the hearts of the simple. So you have wisdom. One of the tests for is wisdom. Do you fear God? What's the evidence of you fearing God? See, that's one thing they don't like, brother says Christ. They don't like evidence. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. They don't want the evidence. Paul says, prove your own selves, because the Corinthians, and you get into uh, Galatians, and you get into some of the other ones, he's like, prove your own selves. They don't like that. They just want to have a profession of faith that everyone's supposed to shut up and not say anything. Don't you talk about my sin? Don't you talk about my walk with the Lord that doesn't line up with this? No, no, no. No judgment. No judgment. They don't want to prove themselves. They don't want the evidence. They're trying to hide and get people from looking for the evidence of salvation. What's the evidence that you fear God? You're doing your best to keep His commandments. What's the evidence that, you're, that you, you got saved and born again? You're born again. What's the evidence you got saved, that God saved you? You're born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have the new birth. You're the new man, the new woman. Okay, the new man and the new woman. That's the evidence.
that's the evidence. Okay, brother says Christ, that's the evidence. And some of the brethren today, they don't have the evidence that have fallen away. The evidence isn't there. It was there. They had it when they got saved. They were gung-ho. They can go five, ten years, and then they fall flat on their face. They get distracted by the world, the left and the right. They stop fearing God and start fearing the world. We'll get in that a little bit more in just a second. Sorry about that, brother and sister Christ. Had to, uh, had to replace the battery. But we're on wisdom, fearing the Lord and keeping His commandments. And Declan here got a little... Uh, once I got up, he jumped up and wanted to run around a little bit. But, brother says, Christ, what do you do when you come across someone that looks like they don't fear God? If you believe they're saved, correct them through the scriptures and get them back to fearing God. If they refuse to fear God, what do you do? You treat them. I always say this. I go back to preaching the gospel to people. If you doubt their salvation, preach the gospel to them. Why? If they're saved, you're reminding them why they got saved who it is that saved them, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they're supposed to be serving. Not this flesh, this wicked body of flesh, not the world, and definitely not Satan and his ministers. Who you serve? Jesus Christ. You've forgotten. If they're fallen, if they're someone who's saved and has fallen, and that's why they don't pass this test of wisdom, they're not fearing God, they're not keeping His commandments, try to uh, correct them. But remember, in, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If peradventure, or if they, they recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Okay, brother says Christ, by all means. If, you're, if someone's a professing Christian and I don't see that fear of God, and that love of God's word, and wanting to hide it in their heart and live it, I will confront them with it as a brother and sister in Christ, and I will try to witness to them and correct them through the scriptures in meekness. And my love for you, trying to get you back up in a standing position, is supposed to be our motivation. We're supposed to do it out of love. Okay? Out of love. Now that's wisdom. That's the first test. Are you in Christ? Do you fear God? So when God gave you the command, first command, to keep the gospel, did you, do the go did you follow the gospel that God commanded us to follow? Or did you get talked out of it so you can have the world? So you can keep the flesh, you can still keep the world, you can do, still keep doing some things Satan's way. The Bible talks about doctrines of devils, uh, the fiery darts of the wicked. You put on that shield of faith whereby you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You start doing things Satan's way, the world's way. He's the lowercase g God of this world. What about the next test? Well, the next test would be in righteousness. He made unto us righteous. That's what it means to be in Christ, a Christian. What's this righteousness here? People will say, well, that's just Jesus' righteousness imputed to us. Uh, no, I believe it's more. What's more than that? that? I don't know about saying more. I believe it's talking about putting on that breastplate of righteousness. God has given us a breastplate of righteousness that we have to put on. God's righteousness is imputed to you at salvation. That's there. That is there. But we're going to find most of that out because we're going to have, when we go up, we're going to notice that there's people, I'm, going to be, I would, I'm telling you, Brother Christ, there's going to be people that you're like, I don't think they're saved. And they go up with us. There's going to be some brethren, I know that person, I just, I just know it, that they might not go up. That righteousness that's imputed to us, it's one-on-one -on -one between you and the Lord. And we'll find out when we get to heaven. What I believe this righteousness, more than anything that's talking about, is putting on that breastplate of righteousness. Now you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Okay, you put on Christ, the Bible talks about. You put him on. Now that you're saved, you put him on. It's an action. It's something you got to do every day. You're living for Jesus Christ every day. And I was in the military, and I've said this before, when you're in the military, you have to wear a uniform, okay? And the uniform will say your name. It'll say the base that you're at. You'll have patches that has to do with the squadron and the base, basically who you represent, who you work for, who you belong to. You know, they own you, <laughs> and when you sign up, they own you, all right? That's no different with the breastplate of righteousness. You got your name, and someday we're going to get a new name. But 
you got your name that, that we have down here. Jesus Christ, that's who I belong to. That's who I serve. Okay? And in the military, you could soil the uniform. You could soil it. There's some people, I believe, like when you're dealing with false converts, they don't have it on at all. They're not ambassadors for Jesus Christ. They're in it for themselves. And you can tell. Lust of the flesh comes first. They're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. Remember Romans chapter 8? They're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. We, we uh, mentioned the scripture where it talks about whose God is their belly, whose glory is, a, is in their shame. They glory in their shame. Whose end is destruction, who mind earthly things. They're in it for themselves. But when you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you represent Jesus Christ to the world. That's why the Bible says we're supposed to be a light in this dark world. Jesus is supposed to shine through us. That's why the ar whole armor of God is called the armor of light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Not me, but Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. If any man come to me, goes into salvation. You put on the breastplate of righteousness, and you can soil it, brethren, who have fallen away. You can soil that uniform. How do we soil the uniform in the military? Where if you got drunk, if you got a DUI, now you get the it's in towns so when you got the DUI. Sometimes you can get it on base, but in town you get a DUI, the civilians see it. Now you have to go before a civilian judge. They see it. You're a military man. Uh, it used to be a, a adultery. You commit adultery. You soil the uniform. Okay. Uh, when you're told what to do, and you mouth off to your commanding officer, you've soiled the uniform. You've let down your fellow brother, today would be like brothers to Christ, but your fellow soldiers, and you've soiled the uniform. Uh, another way to soil the uniform is if you lost, there was a physical requirement, you had to be able to do so many push-ups, so many sit-ups, run the mile and, and a half, and so many minutes, and everything, there was a physical requirement, and if you started getting overweight and start letting yourself go, you'd start soiling the uniform. Brothers in Christ, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Sisters in Christ, God's got a boundary set for you. Brothers in Christ, God's got a boundary set for you when it comes to our day-to-day -day living in this life. God has set standards for us to keep, we're supposed to be separate from the world. Someone who's an ambassador for Jesus Christ, this isn't our home. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is not our home. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. An ambassador is someone who's in a foreign land that re represents the, the master of the land he's come from. Our home's up there. That's where Jesus Christ is. He's up there preparing a place for us. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll, return, I'll come again and call you. And where I am, there you may be also. I, I, I might be virtue to put you in a little bit. Forgive me, Brother Christ. But Jesus is in heaven. That's where our home is. That's where our eyes are supposed to be. We're supposed to be focused on that the judgment seat of Christ, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ, and when we finally get to go home someday, we got rewards setting up, we've got this judgment coming on how we lived our life down here, and we're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Are you soiling the uniform? Today we talk about how you can lose your testimony. If you're conforming to the world, you'll lose your testimony. When you go to testify, people won't take you seriously, and you're, it's going to be harder for you to lead people to Christ. That's what it means. If you lost your testimony, people won't listen to you. When you try to tell them of Jesus Christ and the true plan of salvation, uh, Peter says, be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in you. That blessed hope. I'm saved. I know where I'm going when I die. No matter what happens down here, God gives me joy. He gives me peace. I'm rejoicing. I'm praising God. I'm giving Him glory in the good and the bad. And someone looks at you and goes, how do they're ready to kill themselves. They're really ready to jump off a building or off a cliff. How is it you got it all together? It's nothing that I'm doing. It's because God saved me and I know where I'm going when I die now. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ and you're supposed to be separate from the world. 
You're not supposed to be talking like the world, acting like the world. You're supposed to be separate. When you conform to the world, you soil the uniform. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's just straightforward. Doctrinally, it's saying that if you see that hardcore, I don't think that person's saved. But for instruction righteous, can a brethren forget and start falling in the trap of loving things down here more than they love Jesus Christ? And they start accumulating a lot of things down here, and they start having a fear of losing things down here more than they fear the Lord. And they start losing rewards in heaven because they're so focused on down here. They're so focused down here. Love not the world. You're supposed to be separate from the world. God comes first. His word comes first. Loving your brothers and sisters in Christ come next. If you're a man in ministry, the ministry comes second. Love it, and that's part of loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. The world comes last. I'm sorry, second to last. You come last. It's called being, the, the Bible talks about selfless. We talk about it, selfless. They're selfish and they're selfless. A lot of preachers are becoming selfish. Things down here are becoming more important than up there. Things down here are more important than loving the brethren. Things down here are more important than the ministry that they've got that God will bless them with being a part of. Things down here start getting in the way of this. They get in the way of your walk. And the lost world sees it. What's going on? You're soiling the uniform. Got another truck coming. They're soiling the, you're soiling the uniform. Here's another one. The adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now the Bible talks about, when you talk about someone who's lost and failing this one right here, the righteous, are they an ambassador for Jesus Christ or are they in it for themselves? The Bible says they are of the world, therefore speak thee of the world, and the world heareth them. They're so worldly that they blend right in with the world. If there was a picture and everyone was wearing a blue dress, the women were wearing blue dresses, and the guys were wearing blue suits, you're supposed to be that one that's wearing a white suit or the white dress. You're the one that's supposed to stick out from the world. But if you're wearing the blue dress and the blue suit and you're just blending right in with the world, you can't even tell a difference. I believe that's a false convert. When you have brethren that have fallen away, they have, they put on the breastplate of righteousness, they've soiled the uniform. And sometimes they can get so soiled, they take off the uniform. And that's why you can't tell the difference between them and someone who's lost. They've taken off the uniform, it's gotten so soiled. It's something you gotta put on every day, brothers and sisters in Christ, every day. It made unto us righteousness. We put on that breastplate of righteousness. We are now ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're given the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Our job, the reason we're still down here, brothers and sisters Christ, and we haven't been caught up the moment we got saved, is now you're supposed to be a light to this dark world. You're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. You're supposed to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Our number one goal is to see people get saved. My number one two goal, it seems in these last days, big time, is to see brethren get back up on their feet. Brethren that have fallen down. Brethren that have backpedaled. Brethren that are trying to resurrect the old man. Trying to encourage them to pray and stay in this book and live for the Lord while you still can. We can get caught up any day now. Right. Know another way you can lose your, your testimony? What's the third one here? Sanctification. Paul says, are we to sin that grace may abound? According to the easy believism, they think we're supposed to sin that grace may abound. No. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. When God saves you, he cleans up your life. Sanctification, this is something you got to do every day. Just like putting on that whole armor of God. You don't put the whole armor of God on a dirty body. You go to God and say, Lord, is there anything I'm doing wrong? I need to repent, forsake, and get back to walking with the Lord. You, the Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. 
I'm not saying sinless perfection. I'm saying I still sin. That's why that sanctification has to be done every day. Every morning. I start my day and wash myself by the watering of the Word. Every day. Start with the Word. Start with prayer. Lord, how's this day going to go? Am I need to, do I need to change anything? Do I need to fix anything? Oh, Lord, I failed you yesterday. Lord, please forgive me and help me not fail you this today. Lord, help me stay true for you. You cleanse yourself. The Bible says, uh, John says, in the book of 1 John, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. Cleanse us clean from all unrighteousness. Sanctification. It says here, it makes unto us sanctification. Someone who's saved repents and makes sure they sanctify themselves every day to make sure, hey, am I clean? Okay, I'm clean. I need to put on the whole armor of God so I can remain clean throughout the day. You put on that whole armor of God every morning. You start the day watering, washing yourself by the watering of the Word. To keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, to keep your heart right with the Lord. And not get messed up by the lust of the flesh, not get messed up by the wiles of the world. But this is Christ, to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and living for Him. Sanctification. The Bible goes all through kinds of things. It says, such were some of you. We're in Corinthians, but there's a lot of things right here. It's like, such were some of you. It goes through a whole list of, of sins. And then it talks to you that there's no temptation taking you such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. We get tempted all the time, but if you give in to temptation and choose to sin, it's on you. Now you're not clean. Now you need to go to God and get clean again. Okay. Eternally, we're clean. Our sins are washed away eternally. You're not going to go to hell if you sin against God today. But day to day, we're supposed to be cleansing ourselves. Sanctification. Mm -hmm. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we pro provoke the Lord to jealousy? That goes into the whole point of communion, Brother Sis Christ. Communion is to, to check your life and check your heart and make sure that you're sanctified. And it's supposed to be a, what do you call it, a conviction. You do, you go, you sit down, you're going to drink the wine, the blood that represents, the, you know, reminds you of the blood that was shed on the cross. He died because of my sins. I don't want to live in sin anymore. It, the cost was great. And now I belong to Jesus Christ. I don't want to sin anymore. His body was broken. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. That's what the bread's all about. When you drink the, the, the grape juice, when you drink, or when you eat the bread, it's supposed to be, you're supposed to, a self-reflection, a self-judgment. That's the word I'm looking for. You're judging yourself according to this book. Am I living right? Am I doing right, Lord? sanctification when you have someone that just oh I'm a Christian and they just look like the world and they're acting like the world and they're just I'm gonna call someone else Peter Ruckman I disagreed with Peter Ruckman he did he I, I know if you watch him a lot I do I love a lot of his teachings I love his encouragement his witnessing his worldly experience that we get to hear about but he talked about one guy that he thought was saved but the guy was trying to live like the devil I just tried to live like the devil and I just can't do it. Well, one of the reasons he's miserable is because the Bible says if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's for saved and lost, absolutely. But the lost can be completely miserable living like the devil. If you're living like the devil, you're not going to have a great time. I remember Peter Ruckman's testimony. He got to the point where his life was miserable. He became broken. But this push that you can live like the devil and still be saved. I don't agree with that. I think that's, that's wrong. Because the Bible says it's wrong. We're supposed to live a sanctified life. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We are now a people that's set apart from the world that fears God, that belongs to God, that fears God, and does our best to keep His commandments. No one, I don't believe anybody that's truly saved and born again gets saved and then the next second say, I want to go live like the devil. No, 
know. You can get deceived. You can get uh, what we call, you, t you, you take one step in the wrong direction, just a little one. Then you take another little step and then you get, you get, you know, the world tempts you, the flesh tempts you, Satan tempts you and his enemies. Oh, come on, just a little bit. Oh, come on, ease up. It's not that big of a deal. And they get you to compromise, compromise, just a little step, just a little step. Just a little step, and by the thousandth little step, you look back and you can't see the path that you were once on, the right path. Can brethren fall for that? Absolutely. It's called falling away. It's called resurrecting the old man. It can happen to someone who's saved, but when you come to someone who's saved and you remind them, because they're going to be miserable if they're truly saved, if they're lost, they can be miserable, but they're going to be miserable, and you come to them and remind them, of the joy and peace they once had when they were on that straight and narrow path, when they were living for Christ instead of against Him. And their heartfelt desire is going to be one to get back on the right path. You come to somebody, stay away from me, I don't want to hear what you have to say, I don't care what you say, I don't care what that book says. Wait a minute, I thought you said you were a Christian. Well, it's just your, it's just, it, you're dealing with someone who's lost. You're dealing with someone who's fake. And brother says, Christ, if you start getting back into sin and worldliness, it's not too late to repent. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, repent, take up his cross daily, turn from that wickedness. Remember it says daily, sanctification's done daily. Turn from that wickedness and follow me. Get back to your walk with the Lord. It's never too late. It's never too late to get back to that walk with the Lord. Get back to living for the Lord. Get back to sanctification. I walk around my house once a month minimum. It used to be a lot, but now it's like once a month. And I say, Lord, is there anything evil or wicked in this home? Anything in this home that doesn't please you? Lord, what about this temple? What about this home? It likens our body to a house. The Bible does. What about this house? Lord, is there anything that's sinful and wicked here? Is there anything I need to get out? The easy believism, the you know, the faith alone crowd, they really hate sanctification. They'll act like they don't with words. But remember, we talk about this, brothers and Christ. It's not just words. God looks at the works. It's the works that matter to Him. How do we know this? Do you remember the parable? Now I'm talking. I believe this is talking about the kingdom of heaven. But you remember the parable that Jesus spoke about the father with two sons. He asked the first son. Go work in my, he told him, go work in my vineyard. And the first son said, I will not go work in the vineyard. And then later on, he repented. And he went and worked in the vineyard. Then the second com son comes around. He tells him, go work in my vineyard. And the second son says, I will go work in your vineyard. But he didn't. His works, he didn't go work in the vineyard. And they were asked, which one did the will of my father? Well, he that actually went and worked in the vineyard. Brothers says Christ, you have them say, well, we're for sanctification. Prove it. Why do they have such a light attitude towards sin? Why are they against the changed life after salvation? Why are they against the new creature in Christ Jesus? Why are they for the world more than they, with their actions and their deeds and they're not against the world and the ways of the world. They, they're, I'm telling you right now, the ways of the world are contrary to this book. You go back, probably not even that long, but like two, three hundred and then back, you could see some ways of the world that lined up with this book. Women wore dresses that were lost. You know, men wore men's apparel when they were lost. There were some aspects that were kind of there because the laws of God are written on every man's heart. They think they're just doing it because this is what I believe is morally right. But what they don't realize is that's the laws of God that are written on your heart. When the lost worlds are doing things that line up with this book. But today as a whole, especially here in America, the world is uh, it's almost 100% against this book. They're not doing things God's way. They're doing things Satan's way. Sanctification. They're against it. They seem to line up with the world more than they do the word of God. With their deeds. Remember, good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. Well, how do you deceive a heart of someone who's simple? They don't know this book, and they're not living it. If you stay in this book, brothers and sisters Christ, and you're living it, and someone comes along and say, hey, fornication's okay, it's not that big of a deal, you can see right through them. 
hey, getting drunk and drinking and having a good time is not that bad. It's, we're, we're allowed to have fun every once in a while. Well, I, you know, the one people that attacked me for that Bible study we did, Brothers of Christ, on fun. Uh, we have the right to, to play and have fun. Something along those lines. Uh, fun is flesh. Flesh is fun. Fun has to do with the flesh. And I had to start changing my language because I was doing things that I kept saying this is fun, but it wasn't the flesh. Going for a walk on the beach with my gospel tracks. I have them in my back pocket right now. My gospel tracks. Uh, not gospel tracks. Uh, memory cards. I got my gospel tracks in my front pocket. Um, but with the memory cards. And I'm talking with the Lord and I'm enjoying the beauty. Like coming and sitting out here and enjoying the beauty and talking to the Lord. I used to say this is fun. And I had to realize I got to stop saying that because this is not fun. This is joyful. This is peaceful. This is ha makes me happy. It gives me joy. I'm able to rejoice and give God glory in this. When, you, when I look back at my lost life and looked at most of the stuff I used to call fun, they got you to call everything fun. But it was all flesh. It was all wickedness. It's stuff that you can't give God thanks in. It's stuff you can't give God glory for. Brothers, this is Christ's sanctification. Have you started to fail the Lord in this area? Did you fail the Lord the first step? Fearing God, you start realizing you're not fearing God as much, and this isn't coming first. You realize you're not being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. You've soiled the uniform and maybe taken off the uniform and put it to the side and not even wearing the uniform. You're starting to blend in with everybody. You're not doing the ministry of reconciliation. You're not being a good living witness. You're not being a verbal witness. Sanctification. You're not cleansing yourself every day. You're not checking yourself. You're not judging yourself. The Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we, should, not, we, would, we would not be judged with the world. You look at war, uh, you know, when God judges somebody, uh, what do you call it? It's casualties. You know, just, that's just casualties of war, you know, cannon fodder, you know. Uh, if you're living right and doing right and God goes to get them over there, you won't get hurt. But if you start going over and hanging out with them, you can get hurt. Chastening of the Lord, for them it's God's wrath, but for you it'd be a chastening of the Lord. You suffer some of the, the drawback. Okay? Sanctification. Then we get to the last one, redemption. The last one's the most important. You say, oh, come on. What The last one, please understand what I'm saying. Looking for that blessed hope and fearing, like I said, by the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Your life as a Christian down here needs to be based off of looking for that blessed hope, looking that judgment seat of Christ. And if you're looking at that judgment seat of Christ, you've got your eyes on Jesus Christ to come in the clouds someday to call us home. Philip Newton, come up hither. If you're looking for that, it's the motivator to make sure that, you're, that you pass the test for wisdom, that you pass the test for righteousness, that you pass the test for sanctification, that your heart is right with the Lord when He calls us home. When you get to heaven, do you want Him to say, here's your penny? I'm very disappointed in you. I, I, I wanted more from you. I expected more of you. I'm just using some of the things you hear parents tell their children when they do wrong. I expected more of you. You're, be you're better than that. You could have been better than that. Here's your penny. I'm disappointed in you. Get out of line next. Or do you want to come up there and you, well, I believe I'm going to fall on my face just as John fall, fell on his face before Jesus in Revelation. The John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that comes back to fearing God. Those of us who are truly saved and born again have that understanding that when I stand before Jesus Christ, I'm going to be falling on my face as if I were dead. Because it's the judgment seat of Christ and my life as a Christian. And I know, I know my life as a Christian hasn't been as good as it could have been. And I'm working on it. Praise God, I am working on it. But I've made some huge mistakes as a Christian. If we get it forgiven here, we get it out of our life here, we might not have to answer for there, but I know I can't be 100% on that. So my fear is we're going to be answering for everything no matter what. We're going to fall on our face before God in fear. You know the easy believism people, they think they're going to walk up and just hug Jesus and pat him on the chest and say, What's up, homeboy? This is my homeboy. This is the big guy upstairs. This is, this is, my, this is my bestie. That's how they act. 
especially with the life that they live. Brothers and sisters Christ, don't get too familiar with Jesus Christ when it comes to forgetting who He is. He's God the Father manifest in the flesh. He's God Almighty, creator of all things. He's a judge. He's going to be our judge. And yes, Savior. Yes, Savior. And one of the t his title is friend. Yes, he's my friend. But I got to remember who he is. Imagine King David and all the men that were with him. He became king. He's now king. Weren't they friends? Yes, but now he's the, he's the king. And they can't. They got to remember he's a king. He's not just a friend. He's a king. Jesus is not just my friend. He's God Almighty. He's my master. He's my teacher. He's my judge. The last thing you should come across is he's your friend. When you go down all the list, the last one is friend. First one is God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. But you're looking for that blessed hope. It's a motivator to do the first three things. What talks people out of it? Well, this false teaching of post and mid trip. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. It's not the great tribulation. There is no rapture. It's caught up. And that event when we get caught up is called the day of Christ, that blessed hope, the day of redemption. Do you fear God? Then don't mess with his book. Stop messing with his book, adding and subtracting from the word of God. But you have the posties that believe that the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. And what does that do? That gets your eyes off Jesus Christ. You have brethren that I love, I learned so much from, that they've taken their eyes off Jesus Christ because they've put off the catching away. They no longer believe in the imminent return. They don't believe in looking present tense for that blessed hope. These are brethren that have fallen away. People always get mad saying, well, post-trib and mid-trib isn't a salvation issue. Most post-trib and mid-trib people I come across that claim to be King James Bible believers, they don't believe in the salvation that the Bible teaches. They believe in easy believism. Head belief, just having the head knowledge. They don't believe in repentance. They often, some of them even take prayer out. There doesn't have to be a changed life after salvation, even though Paul says there is. If any man be in Christ, and we're reading it right here. Here's Paul saying it. But if him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, look, redemption, looking for that blessed hope. It's a motivator to fear God. There's times where I fell flat on my face, and you know what? I was praying, Lord, don't come. You say, who in the right mind would pray that today? Because you're being taught wrong today. I heard a brother in Christ once teach that the, the catching away will solve all our problems. No, it isn't. It'll solve our problem. I'll say this. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I was wrong. It'll solve our problems when it comes to having to deal with this wicked world. You remember Lot? Once again, we'll bring up Lot fil uh, that was vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. Lot. Okay. It'll save us from this wicked world the vexation of this world and the temptation of the world. We'll get saved from this wicked body of flesh, the lust of the flesh and everything. But they always forget that what happens after the catching away of the body of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And if your heart's not right with him now, you're going to have a lot to answer for at that judgment seat of Christ. There's times where I've been in a fallen state and I'm like, Lord, if you come back now, you, you won't be pleased with me. You won't be happy with how, you know, my work. Now, this is another parable that Jesus put forth, and I believe it's talking about the kingdom of heaven going into the day of the Lord, the, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. But he talks about how you have a man that he gives so many gold coins to one, gives so many gold coins to one, to three of them. And I think it's, let's, let's say it's, uh, I can't remember. Please forgive me, Brother Jesus Christ, but let's say two coins. No, one coin. He gave one coin to each one. And then one co guy had five coins in the end. The other guy had three coins in the end. The other one just buried his coin. That Christian that doesn't amount to nothing as a Christian. Not living for Jesus Christ. He fell. Somehow there was a changed life. He saved. But he fell and stayed fallen. And when the Master comes back, when we get caught up, 
those are the three men. And I'm fearful. There's times where I'm like that man over there that has the one coin. That he buried it. I'm falling flat on my face. Sometimes I'm like the man that has two, that made three, that started out with one coin and has three coins. Some days I'm like the man that has one coin that has five coins. I'm doing great. Everything seems to be going great. I'm serving the Lord. I'm loving Him. I'm living for Him. I'm staying in the Word of God. There's days that are tough. There's days that I'm falling flat on my face, that one coin. And brothers says Christ, when I'm falling flat on my face, I say, Lord, help me. And I, I, it's a motivator. If you came back right now and you, and you caught me like this, Lord, oh, Lord, I don't want that. Lord, please help me get this wickedness back out that I let in. Let me get it, get it back out, oh, Lord. Please forgive me. Let me get that sin confessed, forsaken, and help me get back to my walk with you. Oh, I started going the way of the world. I started getting distracted by the world. I started compromising, Lord. Whatever it is, get it fixed now. Because if Jesus called us home right now, would he be happy with you, brother, says Christ? Which one of those coins are you? Which one of those men are you with the coins? Which one? Jesus calls us home. The master comes back. Okay, let's, let's see what you've done for me. I left you down here. I saved you. Now I left you down here to do my work. What have you done for me? Nothing? Nothing? The one man with one coin? You didn't do nothing? You found salvation, but you didn't do nothing? What about you? Okay, you, you got two coins. Okay, that's good. What about you? you? You got four coins. That's good. Which one, brother says Christ? Sanctification. It's a motivator. Once again, my mentor, he turned his back on that blessed hope, looking for it. He put off the catching away of the body of Christ. And it shows by his life that he's living for the Lord and how he handles the Word of God, how he's handling the ministry. I've seen other men in battle buildings that put it off. And they start going downhill real quick. Why? Because they got rid of the motivator to do the first three things. Their motivation for fearing God and keeping his commandments because we're gonna have to we have to answer for our life the bible says for we all must stand before the judgment seat of christ and it says every tongue shall confess every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to god everyone has to give an account of himself to god and if you keep putting it off and putting it off that fear disappears you stop fearing god and what's the evidence that you stop fearing god you're not hiding this in your heart and living it. You start becoming a bad example instead of a good example. You're not being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. The ministry of reconciliation. You're not desperate to see people get saved before it's too late and we get caught up. Sanctification. You're not working hard to live a sanctified, clean life according to the Word of God. What the Bible says is, is sin. Not what the world says is sin. Because then they'll flip it around and say, well, the world says this is okay, but the Bible says it's not. It's the Bible that's the final authority, not the world. Are you a Christian? Are you in Christ? Brothers says Christ, this video is mainly for you to make sure that you're still in a standing position and you haven't fallen. If you're someone that comes across this, that got into the easy believism and you've never repented and believed, confess both in prayer, there's never been a changed life, According to this, what we just read there. You fear the world more than you fear God. You compromise and you keep the commandments of men. Rudiments of the world. Remember that you're spoiled. That there's some brethren that can get spoiled by philosophy. They go back to acting like lost people. They get spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. And they start going after the traditions of men. After the rudiments of the world. And what happens? They're not after Christ. They're not being a good ambassador of Christ. They don't look like they're in Christ. Christian. You need to get saved and born again. If you come across this and you're like, okay, I've been deceived by easy believism. I've been deceived by like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, Catholic Church where they're teaching where I have to do works and I have to die in a state of grace. And you didn't follow the true plan of salvation. Once God saves you, you are sealed. You can't lose it. It's not about works when it comes to getting saved. But people seem to forget that after salvation, works have a lot to do with that judgment seat of Christ. Works have everything to do with that judgment seat of Christ. 
day that we get judged by our Savior, by God Almighty, God the Father manifest in the flesh. Brothers and sisters Christ, get your heart right with the Lord today and start a day-to-day -day thing where you start the day with the Word of God, sanctification, washing yourself by the watering of the Word. Start your day with prayer and ask God, is there more I can do for you? God will open doors. God will close doors. You might be doing everything that God wants you to do. Be content with what God has for you in this life, whether it's food and raiment or whether it's doing work for the Lord. Be content. Okay, I see the doors closing. I see it. We're trying to do the best we can with what we got left. And sometimes I desperately want to do a house church. I'd love to have a house church out here. Brethren, we come out here, brothers says Christ, but the doors are closing. There's some brethren that the door hadn't closed that they choose to isolate themselves. They choose to, to withdraw themselves from the brethren. And that's not the same thing. There's times where God will open doors and brethren won't go through them. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to make sure every day your heart is right with them. Your heart is right with God. And if it's not, get your heart right with God. I put out that video by Peter Ruckman. I try to encourage you, don't faint, don't falter, uh, don't quit. If you fall down, get back up. How do you get back up? Repent, forsake, and get your heart right with the Lord and get back to living for the Lord. Get back up. Get into the fight against the flesh. Get in the fight against the world. Get in the fight against Satan, the enemy, Satan. They're all three enemies, but you know what I'm talking about. Him and his ministers. Get back to standing for this book. Get back to putting on the whole armor of God. Not just the breastplate of righteousness, but the whole armor of God. But the breastplate of righteousness, I belong to Jesus Christ. I need to be a good example of Jesus Christ to this wicked world. What Jesus Christ can do for them that he did for me. He saved me. He can save you. I'll, hopefully this has been an encouragement, brothers and Christ, and I'll end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm praying for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. Please keep me in your prayers. Please make sure you're praying for everyone too, the brethren. Pray for lost people, that God gives them every opportunity to get saved, that God will send someone to, into their life that they will listen to. They wouldn't listen to you when you tried to witness to them. You pray that, someone will send so, that God will send someone in their life that they will listen to. We pray for the lost world, that they'll get saved. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that they'll, if they've fallen, they get back to a standing position. We pray, Lord, that we can be useful to the brethren, be a servant to our brothers. I'm here to help my brothers and sisters in Christ. If they need help, let, you know, open doors for me to help them in any way that I can. Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm praying for you. Please keep praying for me, and I'll see you in the next video.